My Lord and my God, I firmly believe that you're here, that you see me, that you hear me. I adore you with profound reverence. I ask your pardon for my sins and grace to make this time of prayer fruitful. My mother, Immaculate, St. Joseph, my Father and Lord, my guardian angel, intercede for me. O oh, Jesus, Easter glory continues to fill the skies and to enlighten us with your radiance. We really rejoice in this season of Easter. And to say with all our hearts, Jesus, you have risen from the dead. And we praise you for that. We recall all of the sad events of the passion and the death. But in this moment, on this Friday of Easter week, we really rejoice in your resurrection. And we have a moment to, to bask in the glory of your resurrection with the disciples in today's gospel. It's a beautiful reading from the gospel of John that we have today. It's the second time, Jesus, that you meet with the disciples after the resurrection, though the tone is slightly different. Here we find you together with them on the, the shores of the Sea of Tiberias up in the north, far from Jerusalem, where the story begins with the disciples in a sense the place where they were first called. And there on the sea that they knew very well, they see you, Jesus, but they don't know you. They don't recognize you after the resurrection. We listen to these words of the gospel because there are so many little nuggets in this gospel that can sustain our prayer today and to help us to really reflect on what you're doing in our life too in this Easter season. Jesus showed himself again to the disciples. It was by the Sea of Tiberias, and it happened like this. Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two more of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said, I'm going fishing. They replied, we'll come with you. They went out again and got out into the boat, but caught nothing that night. Now, the first thing that really strikes me whenever I read these words, Jesus, is that Peter decides to go out fishing again. Now, that might just seem like a, a natural thing to do. He was, after all, a fisherman. But Jesus was also, at this point, the man whom you had called to be the rock, the one to whom you were going to build your church. And what's he doing going out fishing? Surely he has far more important business to attend to in Jerusalem to sustain and to support all of those Christians who need to hear this message of the resurrection. And we read earlier in the gospel, Jesus said, you appeared to the disciples in Jerusalem itself, so he knows that you are risen from the dead. So what's he doing going out fishing? It's almost like he's going back to his old way of life. It's as if the challenge of all that lies ahead is too much for him. But I think more than that, he's still dealing with the immense guilt and the shame of having denied you uh, when the cock crew three times in the courtyard of the high priest's house. And even though he has already seen you and has heard all of the witnesses of the resurrection, he just can't seem to get past that. And so Peter falls very naturally back into his old way of life to do what he, he knew best, to go out fishing. And obviously Peter, having a, a strong personality and one whom the other disciples really looked up to and one whom the other disciples really followed, naturally felt inclined to go with him. But we see how quickly they kind of slink back into their old way of life too. I'm going with you. They just want to get back out onto the water, it seems, and to sail away from all of the concrete problems that have, have occurred, to face up to the rejection in that moment, and to now face the challenge of, of building up the church and to become witnesses to the resurrection. It was light by now. There stood Jesus on the shore. The disciples did not realise that it was Jesus. Jesus called out, Have you caught anything, friends? When they answered no, he said, throw the net out to the starboard and you will find something. So they dropped the net and there were so many fish that they could not haul it in. The disciple Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. At these words, it is the Lord. Simon Peter, who had practically nothing on, wrapped his cloak round him and jumped into the water. The other disciple came on in the boat, towing the net and the fish 
they were only about a hundred yards from land. Now we see how, in a sense, when they go out fishing, they catch nothing because it's kind of fruitless. They are, in a sense, just wandering around. They have really lost a sense of their purpose. And we know, Jesus, from what you say to them on the shore, that they were sort of finding their own way through life at this moment. And they had taken their eyes off you. And since all our life's projects are going to be like that, they're going to be completely rudderless. We're not going to catch any fish if we take our eyes off you, Jesus. And we forget that our, our purpose in life is, is to glorify you and to seek to put you at the centre of everything that we do. If we feel tempted to slink back into, I don't know, an old way of life of which is covered in shame or a way of life that is not open to, to you, Jesus, then we're never going to catch anything. And how gently you, you teach the disciples that message, first of all, by calling them friends, and then by inviting them to do something very simple, to just fish, something that they always had done. But by asking them to follow your commands, you give them a kind of a new direction, not just to, to fall into their own way of old way of life, but to do what you ask of them. And so they can, in a sense, raise up that ordinary everyday task that they had done thousands of times before, but in a new way by following your command. And let's see how fruitful they are. They, they catch so many fish that they can, they can barely cope with it. There's, there's the answer, Jesus, is that we need to reorientate our lives at times according to the, the glory of the resurrection and to see that, well, m my future plans have you at their centre whenever I'm trying to discern what you want of me, Jesus, then that is ultimately when I will catch the most amount of fish. As soon as they came ashore, they saw that there was some bread there and a charcoal fire with fish cooking on it. Jesus said, bring some of the fish you have just caught. Simon Peter went aboard and dragged the net to the shore, big, full of fish, 153 of them. And in spite of there being so many, the net was not broken. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples was bold enough to ask, who are you? They knew quite well it was the Lord. Jesus then stepped forward, took the bread and gave it to them, and the same with the fish. This was the third time that Jesus showed himself to the disciples after rising from the dead. John uses a, a very particular term whenever he's writing this, this beautiful part of the gospel. He says there was a, a charcoal fire, and he only uses that word twice in the whole of his gospel. Anthracia, from which comes our word anthracite. He uses it here whenever you meet the disciples by the, the shore of the Sea of Tiberias. And he uses the same word whenever Peter is warming himself by the fire at the high priest's house where Peter denied you. And so John is signalling to us very clearly what this gospel passage is really about. It is about Peter having to make that journey back to that time of denial. And since it all makes sense whenever we see it from this perspective. Peter's running away. Peter's trying to fish, trying to do his own thing. It's all trying to deal with the, the shame of that moment. And here Jesus invites him to revisit that scene, to revisit that charcoal fire. And here not to condemn him, but to share breakfast with him, to share bread and fish. In the same way that he shared the bread and the fish whenever he, he fed the multitudes. When that miracle becomes a kind of a foreshadowing of the Eucharist, when he can take the bread and the wine and give that to us every day in Holy Communion. And so we see this beautifully tender moment, Jesus, where you are restoring Peter from all of that shame. And you have to have a very serious conversation with him, obviously, from this point onwards. But you, you want to bring him back to that scene, not in order to condemn him, but in order to free him to take him away from his old way of life and to give him a new purpose. That's how we bask in the glory of the resurrection, to see that the resurrection gives us a new purpose. Jesus, help us to make the most of that whenever you give it to us. I give you thanks, my God, for the good resolutions, affections and inspirations that you have communicated to me during this meditation. 
I ask your help to put them into effect. My Mother Immaculate, St. Joseph, my Father and Lord, my Guardian Angel, intercede for me.